Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all for coming and joining us uh, this afternoon uh, for a very uh, special lecture uh, by uh, Professor Emmanuel Tov. I am uh, Professor Ada Tagar Cohen from the Faculty of uh, Theology, and uh, I'm the uh, director of SISMOR these days, and I was very, very pleased when I heard that Professor Tov is uh, visiting Japan, and he said, we are just visiting Japan. I said, please, please give us one lecture, and uh, he agreed, and we were very, very pleased also uh, to have uh, this opportunity to uh, present also our Japanese young scholars uh, in the field that is related to uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the, today, this afternoon, we will first have a lecture by Professor uh, Emmanuel Tov, and then we will have a break, after which we will have uh, four uh, presentations by our young scholars. Uh, um, most of them finished uh, at Doshe University, the Faculty of Theology, and one uh, scholar from uh, finished his PhD at uh, uh, Kyoto University. And we are really very, very happy to have that uh, opportunity to combine our, uh, um, our knowledge. Uh, let me say uh, a few words uh, about the, our lecture t today. Uh, Professor Immanuel Tov, uh, which was also my teacher somewhere there in the, in the, in the previous millennium, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, he, he was um, actually born in uh, Amsterdam and uh, he moved to Israel uh, as a um, young student for university at 1964. He then, eh, sorry, at the 1964 he finished his uh, BA at the Hebrew University. At 1967 he m finished his master thesis in uh, at the Hebrew University and in 1973 he finished his PhD, so uh, and all of it at the Hebrew University. Although during his studies, he has been um, a visiting student in uh, and a visiting teacher in uh, other places such as Harvard University, um, and um, since then uh, he has uh, become. Uh, professor at the Hebrew University. Uh, I will not uh, count all the all the days because it's quite long. Uh, and um, um, he was a special visiting professor at uh, Dorsha University uh, in 2006. And he was here for three months and all of us gained quite a lot of that experience, students and uh, scholars as well. It was a really wonderful time, and I think for him and for his wife, who came together with him that time, and also this time she's here, uh, it was a, a, a nice, nice period of time. Um, Professor uh, Immanuel Tov has received uh, a large number of uh, awards. Among them, I would uh, count two which are a, a very a, a dear to me. Uh, the first one is the Israel Prize for uh, Bible Research. It's the most, it's the highest uh, prize in Israel for uh, researchers. Uh, and uh, he has been appointed member of the Israel Academy of Science from 2012. Uh, these are just very few things among a large list uh, of honors that uh, he has uh, received uh, during his um, uh, lifetime. Uh, and um, he, he is um, 
uh, a member of the editorial board of the Septuagint of Cognate Studies, which is the, I think, topic he has dedicated his life to, the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which he's also the editor-in-chief of the Dead Sea Scrolls publication project since 1990 to 2009, and uh, through his uh, huge efforts, uh, we have today almost all the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls uh, uh, b uh, have been published. And as far as I understand, most of them are online for all of us uh, to access. Um, I, I will stop here because uh, I could go on and talk, but I would prefer to hear our speaker. And uh, he will talk today on a topic that actually, uh, in, in a sense, I have uh, kind of suggested to him. And uh, he took it, and it is the biblical uh, Dead Sea Scrolls as representing variety in Judaism and early Christianity. Uh, you all have a handout. Please follow up uh, the, uh, the the speech. Thank you, and please, Professor, Professor uh, Emmanuel Tov. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cohen of ADA. Uh, I had a very pleasant time here 12 years ago. And I remember uh, the classes I gave and several familiar faces I see here. I still have a shirt that was given to me with Doshisha on it, and I can wear it from time to time. And I want to thank Sismar for the very kind invitation, and I want to thank uh, Professor Ada Cohen for uh, this invitation as well. It's an honor uh, being uh, with you here today. Uh, scholarship is my life. I, uh, I think what we all share uh, in scholarship is uh, something very abstract that I call the search for the truth. Uh, it's something that I think about every day. It's, um, and, and I think in principle we should all of us be able to, to reach the same truth doesn't matter whether you are a, a religious Jew or a free-thinking Jew or a, a Christian or a Buddhist. Uh, it doesn't always work out, but in my work and all, uh, as a scholar and also when I was the editor-in-chief, we were always able to get at the same uh, ideals if you all adhere, try to adhere to them. I thank the audience, which I think is, is a large one, for coming here. So, the topic that we have chosen together with Ada uh, is something I've been thinking about for some time, and this time I, I enlarged it talking about the variety, the different differences in Judaism, of uh, which different texts there are, and also which different texts there are. I'm talking only about the Old Testament, so when I say Bible, I mean the Old Testament Bible. I talk about Judaism and early Christianity. I will read uh, most of my paper. Sometimes there's a section in between square brackets and I will usually not read them. Uh, I included those sections because there will be a written version uh, in the publication of Sismore, and in that version I will, yes, include those sections. The purpose of this paper, I now start, is to examine the variety within Judaism and Christianity regarding the biblical texts 
used in each of these religious environments. We will focus more on the situation within Judaism than within Christianity since more texts are known from the former group. We base ourselves especially on the situation in, Jude in the Judean desert where a multitude of texts have been found. These texts reflect a different textual reality in Qumran and in the other site in the Judean desert. So there's a whole group of them. The one place that you will know is maybe especially is uh, Masada. These other, these other sites, house, texts that belong to the group that preceded the Masoretic text and that are usually named the proto masoretic text. On the other hand, in Qumran we witness a textual plurality that includes several so-called popular texts. The difference between the various groups of texts is characterized as socio-religious and not chronological. That is, different texts were used at the same time by different groups in ancient Israel. So I thought I'll just say a few words on the blackboard here. If we, if we say that this is the Bible, the different texts of the Bible, I talk much about empty, the Masoretic text. Now, empty, the Masoretic text is the text that we all have in our hands. That is, say, Biblia Hebraica. Or if you have the Japanese translation, that is also mostly the Masoretic text. And the empty was preceded by the proto empty. And the empty itself is from the Middle Ages, 9th, 10th, 11th. But we are now talking about the earliest text, so I talk about the proto-empty. Then there's another group of texts. I talk about the Septuagint. Of course, not so much about the Septuagint, but about the Hebrew texts from which the Septuagint is translated. And I talk about SP, the Samaritan Pentateuch, that is a text that is used until today. It is sectarian, Samaritan, but basically it returns to an ancient text used already 2,000 years ago, and we are interested in the text that was used 2,000 years ago, and that we call pre-Samaritan or proto-Samaritan. And then there are all kinds of other texts from Qumran. So all this together. And later on I will tell you that there is basically two groups. This, I, will, I will tell you that this is block one and this is block two. That's more or less the framework. First about the proto MT. There has been much progress in research of the MT since the first Judean desert scrolls were found 70 years ago. The medieval components of the MT, its vowels and accents, were not included in the ancient scrolls, and they conti continue to be studied as exponents of medieval texts based on earlier sources. However, the continental framework is ostensibly ancient, and it was preceded by virtually identical ancient texts to those found and some of the Judean desert scrolls that are now called proto MT. A new term has been invented for these texts. Few scholars realize today that the term proto MT did not exist 70 years ago, 
At one point, scholars started using that term when describing the Indian desert scrolls that were so closely connected to the medieval text that the latter could be conceived of as the immediate continuation of the former. Moving from terminology to content, I will try to identify the real proto-empty text. However, what is our frame of reference when comparing ancient sources with the medieval text, since the latter differ among themselves in small details? If we take Codex L, that is Codex Leningrad, as our point of reference, there are Judean desert scrolls that differ no more from that codex than the medieval texts differ from one another. These Judean desert scrolls differ slightly from Codex L, merely up to 2% of their weight. I stop a moment. So this is a marble. You take, you take a medieval manuscript, compare it with the Bible that you have in your hands, and it's almost the same text, of course, without the vowels. Is this a marvel of God, or is this a marvel that people transmitted the proto and T very precisely? I do not call this a marvel of God, I call this simply very precise transmission of the text. I continue. The second circle, still within the Masoretic family, differs in up to 10% of its words, in minute spelling differences and in small details in content and language. I assign the name empty like text to this group. So that's a little further away. One of the amazing facts about the Judean deserts, so this is number three, about the Judean desert corpora, text corpora, is that they display a very clear dichotomy. The Qumran corpus is characterized by textual variety, while the other sides only reflect the proto masoretic text. The textual variety of Qumran includes a large number of empty texts in the Torah along with a small number of texts that are close to SP and the LX6, and a large number of non-aligned texts in the other books. In my analysis, there are no Qumran texts that are long enough to be identified as pro-empty. If I go here to the big board, Qumran, all the texts, empty like, text like the LXX, text like the Samaritan Pentateuch, and others. That's what you find in Qumran. Other sites, so you go to the Judean desert, Masada, Nachal Hever, Wadi Murabat, only proto empty. Very important. There's only one explanation for the present situation. The community that lived at Qumran had textual preferences that differed from those of the Judean desert communities. It is no coincidence that in the same period, between 50 BCE and 70 CE, only proto masoretic scrolls ended up at the Judean desert site, and no such scrolls were taken to Qumran. Instead, at Thoran, we find evidence of a variety of textual profiles. This assumption is supported by the evidence of the Tfilim, Tfilim pro, uh, uh, phylacteries, adding a sociological aspect to the textual evidence. The Qumran Tfilim differ from those of the Judean desert sites. For the sake of argument, the latter will be named Judean desert Tfilim even though Qumran is also found in the Judean desert. 
The Kumoan community believed in an open textual approach that included popular text and text that reflected the free copying of the empty text, while the Judean desert communities strictly held on to the empty. Number four, background of empty. I now turn to the nature of the proto empty. These texts, and therefore also the later empty, are a mixed bag texturally before they were incorporated in the empty collection. A slight layer of unity was imposed on them at the later stage. In the first stage, each biblical book formed a textual unit separate from the other scripture books and was subject to constant stage, constant change. Here I jump. I jump to number B. Moving to external evidence, we would like to know which persons held on to the proto empty in early centuries. Turning to archaeological and literary sources, we find the proto empty in two synagogues. We find text and feeling in the hands of the zealots on Masada and the followers of Bar Kokhba in the Judean desert communities and later in the rabbinic literature. On the other hand, there's a long line of users of the proto empty that can be identified with proto-rabbinic, pharisaic and rabbinic circles. And on the other hand, we can also identify the persons and communities that did not use the proto masoretic Text. We'll talk about it later. C. Synagogues. On rare occasions, there is physical proof that empty was stored in synagogues. Three scrolls found in two synagogues provided unequivocal proof of the presence there of proto empty texts. The latest evidence. The pertains to the Levitical scroll from the 1st or 2nd century CE, found in the Arona Kodesh of the Ainbody Synagogue. This is a text that was recently published by Michael Siegel and myself. Very interesting text. <coughs> that synagogue is dated from the late 3rd or early 4th century to circa 600 CE. The text of this fragmentary scroll of Leviticus agrees in all its details, including the paragraph break, paragraph break the Codex L, making it the first ancient source to agree completely with the medieval empty text. And we have under, under the ground in the uh, Masada synagogue, we have two scrolls, one of uh, Deuteronomy and one of Ezekiel. Number D, the people behind the, the Judean desert collections. What the persons behind these two corpora, the zealots of Masada and the followers of Bar Kokhba, have in common is that they were freedom fighters and political rebels. At the same time, in religious <coughs> matters, they closely follow the guidance of the proto-rabbinic spiritual centers in Jerusalem. Some scholars stress the priestly influence on the leadership of the Second Jewish Revolt. I jump. Thus, the proto empty was in the hands of the Pharisees after 70 CE as well as before that time, in addition to being in the hands of similar circles 
that cannot always be exactly defined. But this does not mean that the proto antique shows traces of Pharisaic influence. E. As a counterweight to the communities that use the proto antique, I now turn to the persons and communities that did not use the proto antique. In the first place, this is the Qumran community, in whose midst we found only a single proto anti text, that is, a phylactery. AQ phylactery 1. Other Qumran texts that have been considered proto anti are either too small or their character is too uncertain to be considered as such. I found no evidence that any second temple composition is based on MT. Explanation. I, I add something. This means I go to all the writings that we know. I mentioned them, the Apocrypha, Qumran scrolls, None of them is based on the Masoretic text. That's very important. This shows that MT was not used as the base for writing additional compositions. There are no clear indications that any of the Qumran scrolls, the Apocrypha, or Pseudepigrapha are based unmistakably on MT to the exclusion of other sources. If one were to remove the idiosyncratic readings from the temple scroll or the psharim, we would not be left with empty. Although some Qumran compositions and quotations are based seemingly on empty, this assumption cannot be substantiated when there is no opposition between empty and these other sources. <coughs> In only one case is the text of empty quoted to the exclusion of other texts, but the evidence is limited. That is, you know, in the book of Jeremiah, this pertains to the long empty text of Jeremiah when compared with the short Septuagint text, as shown by Armen Lange for Ben Sira and three Qumran compositions. I jump to paragraphs. We were able to trace the history of the persons and communities that embraced the proto MT. However, we have to be modest about these conclusions because they are instructive regarding the social religious environment of the proto MT, but not about the proto MT itself, which remains enigmatic. We do not know much about the origin of that text before it became the proto MT. We may never be able to solve that issue, although at least in the Torah there may be some clues. Mm -hmm. Section B, large B, the popular text of Palestine. My working assumption is that the proto MT is the text of the intellectual and religious elites of Palestine, and that the other texts were kept with the people. The evidence for this assumption differs from book to book. In the Torah, the proto MT reflects a conservative text that was kept by the groups that may be named the forerunners of MT. The Qumran community held on to the non MT text that may be considered popular. Among these, we find SP, the Alexix, and several additional texts, such as texts that were copied in a free copying style. By the same token, there are many harmonizing texts of the Torah that were kept by the people that were not elite, among them especially SP and the Alexix, that display clear secondary features. I call these popular text, a term first used by Paul Kale. I do not know yet when this distinction can be carried out, whether this distinction can be carried out through 
in the other books. One of the assumptions in my textual outlook is the idea that the SP group and the LX6 are closely connected. The assumption of a common ancestor of the LX6 and the SP was first surmised in the 1815 monograph by Villa and Gisenius, who guided the discussion of the SP and LX6 in a sound direction. In Gisenius' view, the two traditions derived from a common source that he named the Alexandrino Samaritan edition. So, I, I have some words here on the common background of the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint. I will skip this section. Just say in one word that I believe that the Greek Septuagint and the Hebrew Samaritan And the two, although seemingly different, show very clear indications that they derive from the same background. What they have in common is especially many, many harmonizations. That is, they harmonize the text to other texts. Number two, compositions based on the common text base of the Septuagint and SP. The assumption that the Septuagint and SP derive from a common textual base is supported by the fact that several rewritten Bible compositions are close, closer to the common text of the LX6 and the SP than to MT. So there are some surprises here. And many scholars don't know this, that, that there are texts that share much with both the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch. And this can only mean that the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch at one point went together. I turned, I turned to number three, the character of the two text blocks in the Torah. I skipped this section, but will say that in my view, in the Torah, I only talk about the Torah, we have many texts. We have many texts in the Torah, but basically they can be grouped in two main groups. One group is only is the Masoretic text. And I believe that this is, it sounds strange to say, but that this is not the original text of the Torah, because that's difficult to say, but this is closer to the original text. And this is only the Torah. And I've written a paper on this. All the other texts have secondary readings. Secondary readings, that is, they make the text easier and they harmonize. So that's what I'm saying in this section. And I call these texts, these other texts, I call them popular. Popular means these were the texts that were in the hands of the people. 
and they read, and they wrote compositions based on them. And the Masoretic text was in a corner. Maybe not, not the real corner. I think it was probably in the temple. So it's not really a corner. Number four, here I have some thoughts about what happened in the book after the Pentateuch where the situation was different. I don't really know. Because we can't say in Joshua, Samuel, etc., that the Masoretic text is always the best. In Samuel, definitely not. In Hosea, definitely not. In Jeremiah, it's again a different story. So in each book, it's a different story. So it's very hard to know what's going on. There were, so in my, in my lecture is called the Biblical Dead Sea Scrolls as representing variety in Judaism and early Christianity. What I really want to say is that there was in the time, late Second Temple, uh, let's say around zero, around the time of Jesus, we had different texts in ancient Israel. And basically, the situation in the Judean desert is the situation that was probably typical for ancient Israel. Uh, the Masoretic text is the text that actually made it until today. But I call this a historical maybe even coincidence. There was the, there was the text that was with uh, maybe in the temple. That was the text was, that was with the proto-rabbinic uh, groups. And when the temple was destroyed, after the temple, well, maybe we can talk about that later on in more detail, but after the temple was destroyed, the only ones that were left afterwards were the Pharisees. And so we don't hear about Qumran, and, this, and, and we, we don't hear about the Samaritan text, because they went to the Samaritans. Maybe we can talk about this uh, a little later on. Uh, but the point that I want to make is that Different groups had different texts in ancient Israel. Some of them were with the religious elite, and some of them were with the more common people. Now Christianity. So this is part two of my lecture. Textual variety in Christianity. Within Christianity, the textual variety is of a different sort, referring to the employment of two different types of Greek texts. The writings of the New Testament are our only source of information for early Christianity. They are in Greek, yet they reveal information about the Hebrew background of the New Testament, the texts used by the Evangelists and Paul. Even the text used by some early Christian authors is relevant. The early Christians made much use of the text of the Hebrew Bible, but the signs of the direct use of the Hebrew Bible have not been preserved. All that has been preserved are the Christian texts in Greek. We just learn indirectly about the use by the early Christians of Hebrew sources since their exegetical systems resemble those of the members of the Quran community. 
the exegetical systems of the Quran Sharif has have has much in common with that of the Gospels, as both communities base their beliefs on the Hebrew Bible. We now turn to the question regarding which text form of the Bible was used by the early Christians. We noted above that the backgrounds of the individual proto and books differ, but when we reach the first century CE, the proto and already exists as one harmonious unit, and we can ask legitimately about the approach of the early Christian sources towards the Jewish text of the Hebrew Bible. The quotations from the New Testament could have been based on one of several sources. Did the early Christians use the proto the Bible of the Pharisees, such as found in the Judean desert in sites other than Qumran? Yes and no. Not directly. That is, we have no Christian sources that quote from the Jewish Masoretic Bible in Hebrew. But the New Testament Gospels and Paul often quote from that text via a Greek intermediary. For, to all intents and purposes, the Kaike Theodosian Greek revision of the Septuagint reflects the proto MT text, which is the text that may be identified with Pharisaic and Rabbinic circles. The New Testament often quotes the so-called Kaige Theodosian text of the Greek Bible and not the Septuagint. I'll be using this term a few times. I stop for here for a moment. Um, I use the term revision, that is, so that's a revision of the Septuagint. There were several revisions, and one of them that may not be known to most of us, we call Kaige, or Kaige Theodosia. And that revision uh, is more or less the proto masoretic text. So it's a text that revises the Septuagint in the direction of the proto masoretic text. I continue. In other words, the text of the very people that the New Testament often criticizes is quoted in the New Testament. However, in my view, the quotation of the Pharisaic text did not necessarily imply acceptance of the ideas of the Pharisees. In any case, most of the quotations were from the Septuagint. But we wonder why the text of Kaige Theodosian was quoted. In my view, the early Christian's choice of the text was narrowed down to a few options. The quotations were in Greek, as the literature of the New Testament was in Greek. It was therefore natural that the existing Greek translations, which were Jewish translations, were chosen as the base text for the quotations. At that point, there existed no Christian Greek translations of the Hebrew Bible. And in fact, at no point in time were there any Christian Greek versions of the Hebrew Old Testament. When do we recognize New Testament scripture quotations that differ from the Septuagint and are closer to MT than to the Septuagint? Since most quotations reflect the Septuagint, or Greek, these unusual quotations reflect a special situation. <laughs> sometimes use OG, Old Greek, as the presumed first translation of the Septuagint. This situation is recognized especially when the Septuagint differs from MT because of its different Hebrew source or its free translation character. In the case of the free translation of the Septuagint of Isaiah, we can recognize these relations rather easily. In such cases, we can often identify the versions that are quoted in the New Testament, especially the Kaige Theologian Revision from the first century BCE, which preceded the writing of the anti books. This version revised the Old Greek towards a literal representation of the Hebrew text 
then current in Israel, which later continued as the medieval antique. Again, it is now clear that Metro and Paul often quoted from Kaige Theodosian. There is no reason to assume that Metro and Paul produced these literal translations because the agreements between the quotations and known revisions such as Kaige are too obvious. So here I have an example. Quotation from Isaiah in 1 Corinthians. The Septuagint. Well, the empty is Villa Amabe la Netzach. Septuagint cut Epien ho Thanatos is Chusas. Kaige, so that's Theodosian, has cut Epote ho Thanatos as Nikos. And that has not Villa, but Bulla. So it has Bulla. Amabe and not La Netzach, but an understanding, uh, not a reading, but an understanding as, as if it were La Nitzachon. Uh, to, to the victory. And that, quote, that quotation, not the Septuagint, but the Kaige Theodosian reading is quoted in 1 Corinthians. This is really something extremely interesting. Um, I have no precise statistical information as to which manuscript tradition prevailed in the various anti writings, that of the Old Greek or of the Hebrew revisions. However, clearly, the Alex Six was quoted in most writings of the NT, and the use of an early Greek scripture revision by Metro and Paul pertains to a minority. So I summarize what I say in the next uh, paragraph. It remains difficult. No, I'll read it. It remains intriguing that Paul used both the Alexix and the Kaige for the same biblical book apparently under the same conditions and in the same epistles. Paul likewise quotes from the original text in First Kings, but in these cases he quotes more frequently from the Alexix. It seems to me that Paul quoted from different versions concurrently, or possibly revised some of his own writings according to different Alexix manuscripts. Probably the type of text that was used by Paul and that was often central to the development of his ideas was not important to him. That is, during his travels, Paul based himself on the text that happened to be available to him in the communities in which he stayed. This situation caused him to use texts of a different nature. Even Greek texts that derived from the Pharisaic circles with which he polemicized. I skip. The use made, made by the individual author of different Greek versions reflects the textual situation in Palestine at that time as known from the finds from the Judean desert. From the first century BC onwards, there was an ever-growing discomfort with the Septuagint version because of its deviation from the Hebrew text, then current in Palestine. Revisions of the Septuagint started to appear. Our major source of information for this development is the minor prophet scroll from Nachachebet from the 1st century BCE, which reflects the Kaige Theodosian revision. I skip. The penultimate paragraph towards the end. Both the Hebrew 
and Greek texts from Qumran reflect a community that practiced openness at the textual level and was not tied to empty. While the other Judean desert sites represent Jewish nationalistic circles that adhere only to the proto-rabbinic text in Hebrew and the Jewish revisions of the Septuagint towards that Hebrew text. The last paragraph. In sum, it can be said that the textual situation in early Judaism and in Christianity developed along similar lines. Different types of texts were known in both Judaism and Christianity. In Judaism, there were diverging conservative and popular texts, and only the latter were used as a base for compositions based on the Hebrew Bible. Likewise, in the Greek-speaking Jewish Christian community, there were two different Greek texts the Alexix of Greek and a Pharisaic revision of the Alexix, the old Greek, named Kaiger Theodosian. Both were used in early Christian writings without reflecting any ideological intention. Thank you very much, and we have plenty of time uh, for discussion and for asking questions. Septuagint and Samaritan Pentateuch and others are all uh, popular secondary texts, if I uh, understand correctly. So, my question is why the uh, Qumran community uh, use only these secondary popular texts? And the second question is um, in terms of the textual criticism in uh, the Christianity. Yes, no. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> And the second question is, um, is it uh, possible to use the Vulgate for textual criticism? Because in the section of Christianity, you only mention the, uh, the Septuagint and the Kaige Theodosian. So I'm wondering if we can use the Vulgate and also an Old Latin text as well. Which one? Old Latin, a uh, Vetus Latina, uh, if, if, if possible to use the Vetus Latina for textual criticism. And the second question is about the quotation in the New Testament. Um, uh, so, Jerome was uh, was aware. Uh, he understood that there is an agreement and disagreement between the uh, quotation and the Hebrew Hebrew text, Hebrew Bible. And sometimes. Uh, uh, most of the people in at the time uh, thought that the quotation in the New Testament is derived from the Septuagint, but only Jerome noticed that it's not true. There are some quotations from Hebrew text. That's what Jerome uh, was writing. So, and I was wondering if uh, Jerome read only Kaiya Theodosian or he actually read the Hebrew Bible when he uh, noticed this, uh, this fact. And oh, 
And the fourth question is about the uh, the Kaige field ocean. And according to the uh, the, the conclusion, uh, in the Greeks speaking Jewish Christian community, there were likewise two different Greek, the Septuagint and the uh, Pharisaic revision of the Septuagint. So, uh, some scholars think that uh, the, the reason why the Judaism, the Jewish community abandoned the Septuagint is because Christians took, them, took it from them. But um, according to the uh, Nahal Hebel, there is a tendency of Hebra Hebraizing uh, of the uh, translation. So is it uh, okay to think that the reason why Judaism abandoned the Septuagint is not because of the Christianity? Or, I mean, is the transition from the uh, Septuagint to the Hebraizing Greek translation is, uh, is the internal uh, phenomena within the Judaism. That's what I'm, uh, that is my question. Enough. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's a bag full of questions. <laughs> thank you for your interest. Uh, I will remind the audience of the questions. The first question is, uh, we have different texts in Qumran, uh, and why did the Qumran people use only uh, the text like I have written here of group number two? Uh, you know about this as much as I do. I look in the caves and I see what they have, so I can only try. Um, the, I see, so I, I don't know. Uh, I see these texts did not get to the Qumran community. But they did get texts that are close to the Masoretic text, the text that I called empty like. You see, the, don't, don't forget, when the Qumran scrolls were found, people used different terms. In the beginning, so if we take 1Q Isaiah A, which is the large Isaiah scroll, with many, many differences. People even call that scroll Masoretic text. Well, that is really not very appropriate. People called 1Q Isaiah B, which had quite some differences from uh, the Masoretic text, but is close to it. I myself call that also Masoretic text. So I think in the first edition of my book, maybe even in the second, I call it Masoretic text. But then at a certain point I saw the light. So then I didn't call that Masoretic text anymore. Because it's still, it's not the Masoretic text, it's further removed from the Masoretic text. So the Qumran people did not have the text that is in our Masoretic Bible, but in the, I call it the second circle, a little further removed from it. Why? Well, if we, if we talk in terms, in sociological terms, in my, well, it's all theory. Let me start from the other end. The Masoretic texts were found on Masada. And in the Judean desert sites, Nachal Geber Molbaad. These are the, the people of Bar Kokhba. 
these people were very devout people. They rebelled against society, yes. Uh, they rebelled against uh, the Romans. They did not rebel against religion. They have the exact same text as the Masoretic text. And I don't see that text in Qumran. So I can only assume that these people were different from the people that were at Qumran. Why? They were different people. And you might also say the people that were in the Nachal uh, Geber and Masada, they, they were not the Pharisees, but they were close to the Pharisees. And the people of Oman, but this is a direct answer to your question, they were opposed to the Pharisees. They write, they make fun of the Pharisees. They write against the Pharisees. The, one of the things in the in the in the Pshalimis they go uh, instead of Dovushia Alachot they call them. They make fun. Uh, they make fun of of uh, the Pharisees in, 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 in various in various ways, um, and, and, and they they make fun of the people in Jerusalem, and they they shout against the people in Jerusalem. Uh, so, it's in retrospect, I wouldn't know in. The, a priori, but in retrospect, I understand that the text of the Pharisees is not found in Qumran. I understand. Question number one. Uh, the, it so happens the Vulgate, that's your second question, the Vulgate is not interesting for textual criticism. Uh, around 400, the Vulgate is identical to the, of the ancient translations, the most close to the Masoretic text, so it's not interesting. Um, I didn't write it here. It's not in, I could have written the, the Pshita. The ancient translations, the Pshita is the most different. Vetus Latina I don't write, because the Vetus Latina is a daughter translation. So it's in the tradition of the Septuagint, and here and there it is interesting. In Exodus, in Esther, uh, in Jeremiah, it's interesting, but we still don't know enough about the Vetus Latina. But it's a daughter translation. I did not understand your third question sufficiently uh, about Jerome, because you talk about Jerome's view on. Did you talk about Jerome's view about quotations from the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament? Well, um, uh, or did you talk about Jerome? Well, um, so, uh, uh, so uh, in, in the lecture you told that there uh, are some quotations not from the Hebrew, uh, not from the Septuagint, but from the Kaiga Theodosian. And that was, and I understand. Yes, I'm not sure that yes. you're on, whatever, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know much about uh, what your own has to say on this. Okay, yes, yes. The, your fourth question, uh, so we have the Septuagint, that we also call the Old Greek, and then at a certain point, revisions start to appear. Uh, we have this very interesting one that we call Kaige. Since 1953, a book, well, 1953 and 1963, by Bartholomew, called Les Dévanchés d'Aquila. And so Bartholomew showed this scroll found in the in Nachal Heber, um, 
this is an ancient revision and it's a, a long story we could talk about this for a week very important um, that this is the Kabir revision and so the question is these early revisions of the Septuagint were they made because the Jews turned away from the Septuagint because they didn't like the Septuagint because the Septuagint uses the term curios and that in the meantime had become a, 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 a term used in the New Testament. Uh, Septuagint uses the term Christos for Mashiach and that of course is the title of Jesus. Uh, these are all interesting thoughts, but not correct anymore, because Kaige theologian predates uh, Christianity. Kaige is from the first century before the common era. So the first revision of the Septuagint was made because the Jews didn't like the Septuagint anymore, because it differed so much from their Masoretic Hebrew text. So, uh, this, this claim can be made with regard to Atila and Simchos, but not with, uh, with regard to Kaigis Theodosia. Thank you. If we have any other questions, even very simple questions are most welcome for those who don't know a lot about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Please feel free to ask those questions. Any question? <laughs> you can also ask in Japanese and we will translate. You can ask in Japanese. <laughs> Please. May I ask a very small question? Uh, I, uh, probably because I missed your explanation about Kaige Theodosian, so I don't have any idea of that. So you could you? Yeah. <laughs> could you explain? You want me to say a few more things, mm -hmm. right? Sorry? You want me to say a few things about Kaige? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Before 1963, we talked about Achilas, a Jewish translator, very precise, every vision. Somachos, so we talk about 100 uh, of the common era. Uh, so not, not well known, because only a few readings of Achilas are known. Semachos, only a few readings are well known. Theodosian was known because we have Theodosian in Daniel, the whole book. And we have Theodosian uh, in Jeremiah and Theodosian in Job, where we have all the passages that I'm missing in the Septuagint were added uh, well, to the Hekata by origin from Theodosian. So we know Theodosian. About 180 of the common era. Now we come to uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and this scroll was found and Bartholomew Fribourg created a revolution in this small area of textual studies because he said the scroll is a new revision and this revision is the same revision as the man Theodosian. And it's not as late as 180 of the common era, but it's as early. It's 50 before the common era. 
and you should consider this simply a very literal translation. And as one of the signs of this translation, he said, is the word, Hebrew word, gun, which was translated by the Greek word kaige, kaige, which means at least, at least. And this is a sign of that translation. And then he said more. Those of you who know Greek and use the Ralph's edition, so you open your Ralph's edition, now you can forget that your Ralph's edition is the Septuagint. It's not the Septuagint anymore, because in 2 Kings this is not the Septuagint, it's not the old Greek, it's Kaige, so it's complicated. Septuagint studies have been, have been altered. So in, in, in a few books you have to remember that you're not looking in the Septuagint translation anymore, but you're looking in an early revision. It's very complex. Okay. I hope and you'll find all this in all the introductions, or if you go into an encyclopedia, or look in, in my book on text of criticism, you'll find that really. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you very much. I forgot to say thank you very much for your very interesting question. <laughs> thank you. Yes, please. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, I'd like to ask you something. Uh, maybe is there any common uh, tendency in Group B? Yes. But I, it's all reconstruction. It's all my thoughts. The reason I call them group B is that I find what I have in common is secondary readings and they are lacking from group one. Now what I, what I call is a secondary reading is mainly harmonizations. Now I'll give you an example of harmonization. You have a reading, take the phrase Abraham Yitzchak Yaakov. Okay, you have three, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Now if you have in a certain place only Abraham and Yitzchak, now a harmonization would mean that the text will easily say Abraham, Yitzchak, Jacob, it will add Jacob, that's a harmonization. And so in the text of group two, I find those harmonizations, especially in the Septuagint. This is new to you. This is new to most scholars. Because the scholars will look for those harmonizations in the Samaritan Pentateuch. And they are in the Samaritan Pentateuch, but more in uh, the Septuagint or let's say in one chapter uh, Pharaoh says Sarah Sarah your wife in another chapter in the Masoretic text Pharaoh says Sarah and then the harmonization would be Sarah your wife to make the full form, you see? And those forms you have in the Septuagint, in many Qumran texts, 
in the Samaritan Pentateuch and not or hardly in the Masoretic text. It's all theory, but I've written five articles on the five books of the Pentateuch. You'll find those in my bibliography. And there's also one summarizing article written uh, half a year ago. Can I ask something small? Um, I probably have not read those articles. I probably did not, did not read these articles. Um, can I ask um, what stands behind the harmoniz harmonization? Yes. Uh, ideological or uh, well, oral or whatever. Yeah. What stands behind the idea of harmonization is uh, a little bit, let's say, <coughs> the scribal routine, but more so uh, the theology. That is, God doesn't want the biblical authors to speak in different ways. The easiest would be to explain it, let's say, uh, with regard to the laws of the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus you have so many laws, a little bit boring, and they tell you the same or similar laws, and the, the language is similar. But there are small differences, and God doesn't want us, the, doesn't want us to read laws that are slightly different. God likes uh, precision. So the scribe wants us to read the text as he thinks that God would have wanted them to be. Uh, and, that's, and that's why you, the, the book that has most harmonizations are the, in the books that are the easiest for this purpose that is in in, ex, in, uh, in Leviticus. Also in the creation story, for example, So there are small differences in the story uh, of the Masoretic text, but not, uh, not in the Samaritan Pentateuch or in the Septuagint. So it's, it's theology, basically. And that's why I call it popular. There's a problem in calling it popular, of course, but it's a little bit, and I, I didn't invent this term popular. This, this floats around in the, in the scholarship uh, for a long time already. Um, it means it's a little bit edited. Uh, and, and don't forget, I use this only with regard to the Pentateuch, the Torah. process of translation, uh, was it influenced by the Neoplatonism? Uh, there are different scholars who study 
and the influences on the Septuagint translators. Uh, basically, the translation is a literal one, literal, word by word. Uh, but uh, some scholars believe, very few, uh, that there are philosophical influences on the translators. Uh, one scholar is a Greek scholar uh, named uh, uh, Daphne. Written, she has written several papers in recent years. Uh, Daphne. And you will find that she writes about Neoplatonist uh, influences on the Septuagint. Yes. Um, scholars have different views on this matter. Thank you very much. Yeah, the first name is Evangelia. Evangelia and Daphne. Mm, does the Dead Sea Scrolls suggest us how is the information about the name of God? I did not understand. Oh, sorry. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls suggest us any information about the name of God? Okay. Do the Dead Sea Scrolls suggest us information about the name of God? Yeah. A uh, very interesting question. Um, yes. Um, for no new information about the background of the name of God. You don't mean the name Elohim, but you, name, you mean the name yud he uh, pronounced in different ways. So even we have no new information about the background of that name, but we do have information about scribal customs. The scribes uh, were, or many scribes, were uh, very careful in writing. So some scribes did not dare to write the name of God, Yudhe did not write that, but they wrote four dots. So this we call tetragrammata, this we call tetrapunkta. <laughs> if you look in the uh, Psalm scroll from cave 11, 11 to Psalms 8, Theta Punta. This is what some scribes do. About 15 of these scribes. I've written a book called Scribal Habits Reflected in the Scrolls Found in the Judean Desert. And there you find a lot of material on this question. One scribe wrote, Yudhevave and two dots before it, which means, Nota bene, be careful. <laughs> be careful. You're not allowed to erase this. It's only scribal habits. Uh, other scribes wrote the uh, 
all the scribes wrote Yudhe in the ancient Hebrew script. So also which means Nota Bene. Um, it's very holy. Even the uh, Nachal Heber Greek scroll of Kaige in the Greek text Greek text, you have the name of God, not Kurios, but in the Hebrew. So this is the Yod. I don't want to make a mistake because I'm not sure about the hey, but this is the Yod, and so the four letters, I think like this, but Yes. Yes that's <laughs> okay. Um Yud He Bab He in Hebrew letters in the middle of the Greek text, but also in some 30 Hebrew texts in, uh, in uh, the Qumran text. So that's what we learn. And in general, in general, um, Qumran, Qumran uh, compositions try to avoid the name of God in general, they try to avoid it. So if they can, they'll somehow circumscribe. And the dissertation has been written by Stegemann and the articles on the, on the name of God in the Quran scrolls. And on the name of God in the Septuagint, all books, uh, and just like your, your question, I would say twice a year I get a, an email. Dear Professor Toth, please give me your, your background view on what, what is the background of the name of God, you have our head. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Uh, the, the nature of scribes. So while, while scribes, they, uh, it is possible that they speculate the biblical text, and is it possible they uh, deflected their own ideas uh, on something, <laughs> uh, a religious um, concept on the uh, text? So I, I wonder uh, they are, if uh, uh, it is possible to define uh, the scribe as a uh, Kind of uh, theologians or kind of? Uh, theologians or something yes. like that. That's the way it is. That is in the text of Group One. Uh, I think from the third century BC onwards, the Masoretic text didn't change. I think before that time it changed. Uh, the, the Masoretic text is a conservative text. The text of uh, Block 2 continues change. And the, cha and, uh, and the scribes of uh, text uh, Group 2, they allow themselves to uh, insert their own thoughts. That's a, in the 4th century BC, uh, much of their own thoughts, maybe in the third century, much less, as time progresses, much less. Um, not so much theology, but yes, a little bit of theology explanations, yes. Uh, they changed the orthography, the spelling. Yes, they changed the spelling. Harmonizations is one form of change. Uh, linguistic changes. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I have several examples in, 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 my, in, in my 
ברוך וירא מנוחה כי טוב. וירא מנוחה כי טוב. מנוחה is feminine, טוב is masculine. ‫הסמרטן פנטטור בו עושה, ‫והיה מנוחה כתובה. ‫זאת אומרת, ‫אבל אין משהו רעים ‫בהיה מנוחה כתוב, ‫כי הוא ראה מנוחה ‫שזה היה טוב. ‫אז הוא מסכים, ‫אבל הוא מסכים ‫להשתמש בפשוט רעים. And the Samaritan Pentateuch, or the base of the Samaritan Pentateuch, made many changes. And you, you can learn a lot from, from, from this, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, time, unfortunately. And uh, we will uh, finish here our first part of today. Uh, we have a break of 30 minutes, and then we will uh, continue with four uh, presentations. So uh, let us say uh, applaud again to Professor Immanuel Tov. Thank you very much. Applause.